welcome to another episode of History with the Drag Queen, starring me, Carla Marks. Episode 9, History Buffs. Are we excited? I sure am. This has been great nine weeks of entertaining you all with stories of drag and history, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, I'm all, all done up. I just finished doing a show, and I was like, you know what? This look is too good to waste. I'm going to record this right now. So here we are. I'm feeling super draggy, so I think this week we're going to talk about a little history of drag. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Okay, so as a drag queen, I get asked a lot about, hey, about where did drag come from? What is it all about? Can I grab you in the bathroom? No. But the history of drag is actually really complicated. There's not really one uh, confirmed source of, hey, this is where drag started and this is what it's all about. Um, there's still a lot of different information out there about where it came from. Uh, and how it evolved over time. So uh, for me, I'm a historian, so I like to do my research. So I've researched a couple of different sources and compiled a few facts. Um, but a lot of what we're using here today comes from one of the best sources on this. And this comes from, to us from All Stars 3 uh, winner, Trixie Mattel. She actually has a really lovely history of drag. So I'm going to read some excerpts from it, uh, plus other things that I've been researching around uh, other places. So where does drag come from? Well, the number one uh, kind of myth of where does drag come from is from Shakespeare. Uh, that it was an acronym, D-R-A-G, dressed, role, dressed right as girl. That meant that if the role was to be played as a female, at that time all actors had to be male, and so if you needed a woman on stage, so you needed Juliet for your Romeo, it was actually a boy dressed as a girl. Uh, and so that's where that came from. However, the Oxford English Dictionary says that it existed much before that time, at least by 1388. Um, but it wasn't really a common term, so maybe it was around then. Does it really mean the same thing? Probably not. When we really start to see a, a more modern conception of the word drag come around is in the 19th century, the 1800s, okay? Uh, and usually this was uh, used in connection uh, for performing in uh, clothing that was not your own gender. So in 1890, or sorry, 1870, we see the very first written um, kind of clear use of the term drag. It was in Reynolds newspaper in the United Kingdom, um, and it was about a party invitation. Uh, and it was going to be a gender bending party. And so in the invitation in the newspaper, it said, quote, we shall come in drag which means men wearing women's costumes, wrote the paper. Okay, cool. Um, so sometime in the 1800s, this idea came around. It was probably existing sometime before, and it generally meant in that context, male performers wearing petticoats and performing as women. Uh, and so these petticoats were super, super long, and they would drag on the ground, on, and this was known as kind of putting on their drags. Okay. Let's advance to the 20th century. By the 1920s, drag was being used by predominantly gay people. Uh, and one theory was that um, it had kind of come out of this particularly queer linguistic group um, in England, and it was like theater slang, but it's still unclear. What we do know is that by 1927, drag was clearly linked with the LGBTQ plus community. Um, the one of the earliest uh, manuals of psychiatry defined drag as quote an outfit of female dress worn by a homosexual or as an actual event quote a gathering of homosexuals in which some are in female dress okay we see where we're going with this it's a little restrictive though uh, because this wasn't restricted just to men uh, of course duh like no duh um, so at the turn of the century women had started to perform as male impersonators. Uh, and we definitely see this uh, evidence of this with the Harlem uh, Renaissance. Um, performers like uh, Gladys Bentley, she wore a top hat and tails. If you haven't seen pictures of Gladys Bentley, I might even try to slip one in here. Um, and it's possible that the term drag king originated around this time, possibly for Gladys, uh, but around this time, certainly in the, in the kind of mid 1920s. Uh, so this Weimar cabaret era that was kind of gripping uh, a lot of societies. But um, the 1920s didn't last forever, um, and there was some danger, and there was also segregation in these bars um, by, based on race. Uh, and so with segregation and the danger of going to these, um, these bars, we start to see the first drag balls existing. Now, drag balls have actually been around since 1867, the Civil War in the United States. 
uh, when both men and women um, would dress up in Harlem uh, and they would compete for awards for the best gown or feminine figure. So drag ball tradition goes back at least to the 20s, probably even further. Um, nobody was really voguing at that time, but certainly black queer people were congregating together and drag ball culture um, owes uh, obviously its origin and, and a massive debt to its culture to, to that, uh, to, Af to African-American or black Americans. Uh, during this time period, there was a division amongst queer white men. Um, generally, they kind of, we're talking about the 1920s, they divided it either as, you know, a masculine, a guy who kind of tried to blend in, or you were deemed a fairy, feminine, and that was deemed dressing in drag. Uh, so in bars, half the crowd would wear drag to get around laws that forbade people um, to, to dance with same sex. So two men could dress together, but if you're dressed as a woman, you might be able to get away with this. Um... Of course, there's laws that um, restricted you wearing clothing to opposite sex, but we start to see this happen in the 1920s. Jump ahead to the 1950s, we start to see what we think of as drag queens performing in clubs, entertaining the crowds. Uh, the, one of the first places that we see this is in San Francisco at an establishment called the Black Cat. Actually, very sadly, San Francisco's oldest gay bar uh, just shut down um, this week. Bummer. Um, so, uh, as more gay bars began to pop up, drag started to become a gay art form, but not just straight men impersonating women for the sake of comedy. It starts to rise in multiple different ways. The 70s is actually a low time for drag. We don't see as much of this happening. There's more masculine vibes. Uh, men being men and, and kind of impersonation of women or doing drag was somewhat on the outs. There are obvious exceptions to this. John Waters, 1970, 1972 film. Uh, Pink Flamingos, Divine does her thing. It's wonderful. You've got to see it if you haven't. Um, so there's definitely some, uh, you know, drag culture happening in the 70s for sure, but it wasn't as necessarily quite as popular. Into the 1980s, drag takes on a very particular meaning, and that is looking like a woman. Uh, what we kind of almost call impersonation. Um, and this is very much the drag that you see in uh, documentaries like Paris is Burning. Uh, where it was kind of a high fashion evening where you had categories like butch queen, first time in drag at a ball, or high fashion evening wear, or these kinds of things. So it was a lot about, um, you know, looking as much as possible like the opposite gender. Uh, in Paris is Burning, you also see the opposite. You see um, cis women presenting themselves as men. Uh, but drag was starting to catch on. It was starting to attract a much more mainstream audience. Uh, the annual Wigstock Festival in New York started in 1984. And not long after, uh, we see kind of the rise of someone who's kind of emblematic of a broader movement, RuPaul, um, that in 1993, she kind of elevated herself to the status, you know, of kind of a, a national drag queen. The Washington Post called her America's favorite drag queen. Um, and in the 90s are really when we start to see drag as we know it getting going. Drag kings are also very, very active in the 1990s. Performers like Murray Hill. There's whole books about how to be a drag king. Uh, and even the first international drag king extravaganza in 1999. Um, and so uh, visibility of drag was at a high point in the 90s. It was growing and growing. And this is when we start to see uh, the LGBTQ plus community um, starting to differentiate between drag and expressing gender identity that these two aren't necessarily the same thing uh, and a distinction between drag kings and the trans community becomes much stronger and more understood uh, the public starts to become aware of the differences between being trans gay and doing drag um, these lines sometimes get blurred even to today but there's a more of a distinction it's growing and growing um, so the 2000s um, really start to broaden the definition of drag away from just realness. So female impersonation, uh, we start to see a much more expansive art form for gay men, trans folks, queer women, and everyone else. The 2000s really start getting this going. 2009, RuPaul's Drag Race premiered on Logo TV. We're now 12 regular seasons, four and a half all-stars, a UK, a Canada. It's a cultural phenomenon, and it's led to people talking about the quote golden age of drag and it really is drag queens can make a full-time living what doing this and 
you know, it's more accepted than ever before. It really is a high mark for drag as a pop culture phenomena. It's gone very, very mainstream. There's also really interesting subgenres of it as well. So it's not just what you see on RuPaul's Drag Race. There's amazing things. And if you haven't been to a local live show and seen amazing drag kings, queens, things, monarchs, just humans living their lives on these stage, it's really, really wild. There's so much drag out there beyond what you just see in RuPaul's Drag Race, and I really, really recommend that you go and check it out. Okay, so um, that's kind of my fast and dirty history of drag. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it's been lovely talking to you. Um, and yeah, my name again is Carla Marx. Here's my tip link if you uh, feel able to uh, financially contribute. I'd like to give a very special thank you to Martin Jones and also Tracy Marie for assisting uh, financially with the creation of this show. It, every dollar and cent that you do tip makes a world of difference for me. So thank you so much for your continued support. As always, please like, comment, share, distribute this as wide as you can. Let the people know that I'm out here doing this thing. It really, really warms my heart, and I love it, and I love you for doing it, so thank you so much. So, get on that game. I love you for it. And as always, if you have a suggestion for another topic you would like to see, just bang it in the comments, and I'll see what I can do with it. All right. Thanks so much. This has been History with a Drag Queen, Episode 9. Our 10th episode is coming up. That's exciting. Okay. See you later, babes. Bye. Oh, <laughs> oh,